Darek, software architect at Broadcom, who will be talking to us about improving network latency and throughput with dynamic interrupt moderation. So, so as expected, this is a, uh, obviously a talk with wide appeal. Oh, should turn this on. There we go. Is that a little better? All right, yeah. As expected, this is a talk with uh, wide appeal to many conference attendees. Uh, something is uh, sometimes f feels dry, like the kernel, or uh, doesn't contain a container buzzword. Um, might be problematic, but uh, I'm really pr proud of this work we did, and really glad that we could uh, that I could come here today and share a little bit with it with you uh, on this. And in particular, I think this is a good fit for this track, uh, surprisingly. So um, rather than thinking about calling it um, what it is, which I can't read, um, you know, improving network latency with Jim, we're going to talk about auto-tuning your network. So, um, and I thought add a little little picture of our, fam our, our favorite auto-tuning artist there. Um, so what is dynamic interrupt moderation? So for those that we've got to go through a little bit of review, what this might be, people probably maybe, maybe aren't familiar with how the packet, how packets in the Linux kernel actually make their way from physical hardware into the uh, kernel stack itself. So the main idea here is that we're going to tune the time between when the first frame arrives on the wire or off the wire completely and, and when an interrupt pops. And so there's a variety of reasons to do this. Um, we'll go into those in a little bit, but this is kind of the flow. So we have an interrupt that pops, um, we schedule a polling event, and that polling event then ultimately reads, reads the receive ring of the NIC. So in this uh, beautiful picture, we have uh, frame zero to frame N and a head and a tail. So these are, these are essentially considered to be the frames that have not been read and pulled out of hardware yet and marked as complete. So it's kind of a typical workflow. If our arrow going from left to right indicates time moving on, um, each forward facing or upward facing arrow would signify an interrupt and the stack of five rectangles indicates five frames that are read out of the ring buffer. So in a fairly consistent flow of traffic that you have coming in, this interrupt period, um, as I'm waving my hands from this first one to this next arrow, would, would represent um, the interrupt timing that we would have. So we're going to get a little, have a few frames come in, service them, pop another interrupt, more frames, et cetera, et cetera. In a steady state, this looks pretty good. So if we have a short interrupt time, of course, this means that we have a really small number of frames processed in each polling event. Now, that can be good if your concern is latency. That can be bad if your concern is throughput, because an interrupt is pretty expensive. So if we think about doubling the interrupt period with this same traffic flow, we'd have a situation like this, where instead of just receiving five frames with each polling event, we would now receive 10. So this is a great case for a, a, a great description of a workload where you want high throughput. And also, the downside is high latency. So, as you, might be surprised, as you might not be surprised to find out, this is not a particularly new problem. This is something that people have been dealing with for a long time. So, one of the first attempts to deal with this, administrators, yeah, literally decades. Um, I think I first probably came across uh, an issue like this easily in the knots, um, if we're calling this lab, the previous decade that. And regularly would have to talk to customers uh, when I was at Red Hat to try to figure out whether or not um, how, how they should tune their devices. So the first attempt at really dealing with this was in one of Intel's 100, one gig adapters. They had a hardware feature called AIM, or Adaptive Interrupt Moderation. And um, this was actually the source of a uh, fairly what ultimately was a fairly long-running bug to try to figure out uh, why someone was having a particular problem, because they were primarily concerned with low latency, not with uh, throughput. And unfortunately, at the time, um, when we were only dealing with a single receive queue, uh, most people were concerned with throughput. That was the big, one of the big tests that was done. So one of the things about AIM is it was liked by some, disabled by many. Uh, like many of the hardware features that have existed in the past, there's always a little bit of angst. Uh, hardware designer does it, it rolls out some software to configure it, 
maybe it doesn't work exactly as everybody expects. So then there's some significant frustration about, you know, why does this feature break my network? So kind of the same story over and over. Works for a lot of folks, but the lack of flexibility that existed in hardware um, was not good enough for some. Um, they always, people always seem to default to thinking that software is more flexible and better. Uh, and for many cases it is. So at the time, one of the interesting things is that uh, we sat around the office and postulated whether or not it would be good to have a user space daemon that controlled this interrupt timing. So at the time it was, at the time this happened, is when we were first starting to see some of the Tune D profiling come out uh, on various Linux distributions, uh, most of them Red Hat and Fedora. And you could, you could tune your workstation for whether, or your laptop for whether you were most concerned with high performance or whether you were concerned with better battery life. Or I think there, at the time there were even, some, there were even some, some networking configurations that were available. And many of these things twiddled bits in Intel's power management uh, capabilities at the time. Um, and so we thought, well, what if we did a parallel? What if we came up with something that could, that could really have, have an administrator at the beginning of time say, you know what, this is a, this is a workstation where latency is the most important thing. So let's tune for that. Or what if we, you know, this was a, a file server where we cared most about moving bulk traffic on a regular basis. So we sort of sat around the office and pondered whether or not that'd be a good idea. Um, and, and I think ultimately when I look back on that now, we've come to a realization that that was completely and totally the wrong strategy. So um, we could say it was blind luck that we didn't implement that, but realistically it was probably more about laziness than anything else. And so, Let's fast forward a few years and think about where we are now. Um, so machine learning, AI, everywhere. Um, I'm amazed, I'm like sadly amazed by how much it's on our phones, you know, things automatically presuming a time of day that you want to do something based on where you're physically located. Um, like, and I don't know, it's, it's funny to me how impressed I am by just little tiny simple, simple things that you're probably never taught in any sort of CS or computer engineering program anywhere. And so one of the first things that, was, that, that came to mind is a talk that Tom Herbert gave uh, at NetDev uh, in uh, Montreal last year. And he talked a little bit in his keynote about the impact of artificial intelligence. And you can see I've got a, a screen grab of his uh, video on YouTube about this with the link here. Um, all very clickable for everybody right now. Uh, and, you know, he, he, he talks about the fact that, that machine learning, and he's, he's, he's got a new, a new company that I think uh, or machine learning will play into this. But one of the things he talked about is, like, will the, the latest congestion control algorithm, uh, TC, TCP BBR, be the last human written congestion algorithm that exists? And it kind of struck me when I was thinking about this, like, how interesting it would be to think about that being the last one that's written and how through machine learning um, we could come up with better ways automatically. It's a little bit Skynet-y, a little bit scary, uh, but at the same time, uh, I, I think the, the power that we have, this massive compute power, and their ability, software's ability to do the same thing over and over uh, effectively, that mouse is moving around, um, is, is not good, or is, is good for us. The mouse is not good. So, um, coincidentally, Mellanox added support for uh, what we're now calling DIM in their uh, main uh, 2550 100 gigabit driver in 2016. And, uh, bless you. And the fact is, we were, um, I was trolling around looking at their driver and wondered, like, now what is this, this operation here? This doesn't, this doesn't really make sense. They're doing something on receive. They're doing a little bit of data gathering, it looks like. And it looks like they're kind of using it to make a decision later. And that's exactly what they were doing. So that they were calculating how, how many bytes were coming in. They were counting the number of times an interrupt popped. And they were using that data to come up with what they felt like was an optimal setting for their uh, the receive interrupt timer. So if we go back here a second, remember our two pictures that we had. So this one, pretty steady state, regular interrupts, servicing a small chunk of packets at the time. This one, longer interrupt rates, serving more bulk traffic. So it looked like they were trying to figure out a way to um, know which time was the best based on the traffic that came in. 
Uh, not pictured in either of these slides is the fact that there's a different, each one of these packets could be a different size, each one of these frames, um, which also plays into it because, again, um, it's easy for us to think when we receive a packet and we just know that it's long, it's easy to think that uh, it, it's all the same, that a 64-byte packet and a jumbo you know, 8K, 9K frame is the same. But realistically, they all take a different amount of time to be on the wire um, because there are discrete bit times required uh, to handle these things. So, so I, thought, I thought that was pretty interesting that, that Mellanox had that. And we started looking at it. This is basically how it works. So uh, in this slide, uh, credit uh, Tal Gaboa from Mellanox. Uh, he gave a talk earlier this year on this. Um, take a sample, compare that sample to previous uh, runs, previous iterations, and then decide whether or not you want to make a change. Um, so when we dug into it, it seemed pretty good. So the other cool thing, um, and one of the things that we see as a kernel developer, I'm okay with it. One of the things we see a lot of talk, at talks is you know, escaping the constraints of the kernel. You know, people feel the kernel limits them, and the DPDK is so much better, or some other uh, thing is better for their application. For their individual applications, I would 100% believe that. One of the other things this allowed us to do is by running this in a driver, um, we escape sort of the lock-in that the global lease tool API uses for configuring these interrupt timers. So in the past, when still today, because there's interest in keeping ETH tool pretty static, if you configure interrupt timing, it, it applies across all queues. Um, we, of course, now live in a networking world where it isn't just a matter of a single queue receiving all, these traffic, all this traffic, multiple, uh, multiple uh, cores are tasked with servicing this traffic, which is how we can get to 50, 100, and pretty soon 200 gig Ethernet uh, on a server. So this allows us to escape some of those, that kernel, kernel lock-in. Um, so what we really found is that because it can operate independently, we can also have different types of traffic being handled by different cores. Uh, this is especially useful in a virtualization case where you might have an application uh, that needs to be low latency that's running in a VM. Uh, or you might have another application that's ultimately serving uh, as a storage destination. Um, so having now all of a sudden we could have the best of both worlds. We could run a net perf test and receive full uh, utilization of, of, a, of, that, of that core uh, at, max, at pretty much maximum throughput. And we could run um, a TCP RR test with net perf at the same time and see low latency because they're end up being serviced by different CPUs. So that was super cool. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about the algorithm. Uh, it's not super amazing. Um, and the great thing about it is um, I'm here talking about an algorithm today that's actually open source. It's in the kernel. You can look at it. So spending a lot of time explaining how it works is not probably super valuable. Um, because I know everyone loves reading kernel code. I know it's what that helps them uh, sleep at night, uh, as well as it's the first thing they read in the morning. Uh, so. In a typical case, uh, we have five profiles that exist right now. So um, you can see what's critical at the top is the different timer settings. So obviously down here on the far left, this would be the low latency case. So we want the timer to pop really quickly. And on, down on the far side, the timer of 256 microseconds would be the high throughput case. So the, the reference to left and right is something that's uh, baked into this uh, algorithm. And everything starts down here at the low latency case. Um, I think that makes a lot of sense to start there rather than starting in the middle, um, because typically low latency is going to be small traffic. It's typically going to be quick sessions. It's typically going to be a small number of bytes. So it's default to that. And the rate at which we sample and the rate at which we make changes quickly moves us down the line to the right. So this decision tree is really pretty simple. Um, we have. Our, our previous decision, uh, either right or left, we compare the samples that we've collected on every single packet we receive and every single interrupt we process. And then we make a decision, well, is, is, is this better or worse or the same as before? If it's the same, we park it, uh, an analogy that probably applies to everybody that drives. If it's worse, we go left, in the case where we were previously going right. And if it's better, we go the opposite direction. We go more to the right. So um, the, the compare samples uh, piece can also can be tuned a little bit depending on your 
your workload or your speed. But really one of the coolest things about this is I've tested this across fast processors and slow processors and um, super fast processors, if we want to have three examples. And what really works is this holds up across all of them. So this is something that works in a small system, maybe a even a 32-bit uh, ARM case, and it's something that works on works well on the latest uh, Intel devices. So, all right, so I mentioned Intel and Mellanox, but what about Broadcom? I mean, they're the ones paying, paying for me to come here and talk about this. So, of course, this is the, the big reason I'm here, is that we found this to be interesting. Um, we ported it to our driver, and we really liked what we saw. Um, in fact, it was um, other people confirmed they really liked what they saw. So here's uh, some super fun graphs. Um, so in the case of default and adaptive coalescing in this first picture on the left, you can see that basically the throughput was unaffected by the number of streams. This was a 25 gig NIC, that's why we're up there at the top. So we can almost fully utilize that just with one core. Um, and certainly once we hit two cores or two streams, we're utilizing it 100%. Um, and the, gra the, the point of this here is to show that um, even with the small hit that comes with cataloging this information, uh, we, we're pretty much right on with throughput. There's no hit there. The graph on the right's a little more complicated to understand, so I'll explain it a little bit. Um, the x-axis represents uh, the number of streams in use, and the y-axis represents the total CPU utilization. So unsurprising with one stream, we're utilizing a, a one core completely. Um, it's, as as the, the graph is kind of funny that there's a two and a half core example there, that wasn't really what we did. We, there's a dot there at two. It would've been nice if that's how uh, whatever spreadsheet technology we're using to graph this would have chosen to put the lines at two. But anyway, um, at two, with the default coalescing settings that we have in our driver, uh, we saw much higher CPU utilization uh, because there wasn't the ability to adapt and have the interrupt timer move way out. And uh, on the case on the right, lower is better, so adaptive is clearly winning as we scale up towards eight cores, um, or eight, uh, eight cores being used for receive traffic, you see there's a 7.0 there. Um, we're still not even, we're barely over, barely utilizing two and a half cores completely when you add all that up, versus uh, close to probably four and a half, four and three quarters um, with the default settings. So we feel like this is gonna be a huge win uh, in, in the throughput case. Um, the other thing we did is we did some TCPRR performance. Um, now this is a, I hesitate to show raw numbers here because every time I get a new system in with a new processor, these numbers all change. But we went ahead and put it in anyway. Um, uh, so with our original static coalescing at the best rate we could do, we could do about 20,000 transactions per second. With adaptive, we're a little bit less. So I'll talk about why there's a 4% reduction. But we were really happy with this, to be honest. The fact that we're paying attention to every interrupt, paying attention to every byte that came in, and doing computation um, on those, not on every packet, but uh, statistically within a certain number of packets, we would analyze whether or not we need to make a change. The fact that that only caused us, um, in, a, in this single stream test, a, a total of 4% hit, uh, we knew was gonna be a real positive, and um, at least for the, the people we were going after for this, and, and they, were, they were quite pleased. So, um, we also confirmed that one receiver ring could be optimized for low latency, and another for high throughput. This was really the case that I think was most interesting to me. Um, I think this flexibility just doesn't exist today in the Linux kernel, so by adding this feature, we were able to provide something that really, other than Mellanox, no one else could do. So um, I was really happy, and, and um, what we decided to do was rather than just take Mellanox's code uh, and completely add it to our driver and that seems really weird in some ways. Um, I worked with uh, Tau Gaboa at Mellanox, and we actually made a generic uh, layer and library. Now yesterday, if you, if you sat through uh, one of the late afternoon talks, so there was a panel, and said, oh, AI's not just about adding a library and thinking that like everything just works magically. Um, I won't necessarily refute that, but I will say that uh, in this case, that's one of the cool things about this, is you can just add a library. You add the right probe points within your driver, you add a function call that can set this value in your hardware, and you can just use it, and in fact, um, after posting my first patch uh, upstream, I got several off-list emails about this 
people who are interested, and um, one of them doesn't even work in, does, does happen to work for Broadcom, but not in my division, so didn't know he was interested. But the uh, BCMG net driver uh, used this right away, and in fact, um, they also adapted it and wanted to use it for transmit as well. This is a great example, in my view, of the power of this, because this is a, a driver for an ARM SOC is typically embedded in set-top boxes. So if you um, have used any, pretty much, many of the triple play offerings from ISPs where you can plug a phone in and you can plug some ethernet in and it has Wi-Fi built in, um, that's the type of application that this has. And this, this type of application for this. And in their case, they've got a wide array of traffic patterns. Um, you might have home use traffic that is you know, streaming video, and so you're gonna have large frames, you're gonna wanna, wanna make sure you're optimized for that. But you're gonna have other flows that are very small, or very short term, and uh, as soon as this came out, uh, Florian Finelli is the one that did this work. He was uh, excited about it because he'd been, they'd been pondering the fact that they saw such a huge difference in the way their systems performed when they would use different values. So the fact that this could do it, uh, tune it for them without doing anything, uh, they, they were pretty, pretty stoked about. So more drivers to follow, I don't know. I've talked to folks at Intel. They have... They have a little something in their driver that does something similar. They also have uh, some hardware that has some fun, fun features. Uh, we additionally have actually, amazingly, lots of hardware IP blocks to try to handle uh, this situation. We have more than just a basic interrupt timer. We've got several things that we don't completely expose because there's no API. And part of the, part of the challenge for this was actually um, working, Michael Chan and I working out which how we should how we should handle this, um, and how we can how we can best you know give customers and more importantly administrators the opportunity to run this. Um, no longer are the theory should be when this is when this is working and this is in the distro and this is everywhere. There should be zero support calls. Again, that's the theory. There should be zero support calls to anybody who, who says, oh, my network's not performing in this low latency case. Oh, it's not performing in this, this bulk transfer case. This should be done. This should eliminate those calls. So we have, we have outsourced this, this work to the machines. Um, so I want to share just a couple observations, um, some, some surprising, some not. Uh, for me, this was a fun thing to work on, uh, which at this stage in the game, working on the kernel as long as I have, that's sometimes a little bit rare. Um, so one of the first things we came across is that programming hardware can be expensive. Um, and when I say expensive, we're still talking about milliseconds or microseconds, but it can be. And this is a, a common case across multiple hardware vendors. Um, in fact, we spent a lot of time tuning and understanding when the ideal point, when, when's the ideal point to sample, when's the ideal point to decide whether or not we should make a new decision because you can do it so frequently that you see a much greater than 4% reduction in your, in your uh, low latency tests. And, um, and this, this expense, um, when running on the same CPU as the traffic, as the, as the CPU receiving the traffic, uh, does, is gonna cause a small interruption in traffic. So uh, we talked about scheduling on other CPUs and we decided that was, uh, that was a, uh, an experiment that, that we could look at for another time. But, but another thing to think about, you know, the, the cost of doing these operations to hardware is never free. So a good thing to remember. Um, the other thing we found is that we had a few benefits that, it, that appeared sort of unexpectedly. So when we were doing some testing, uh, we had a typical test case where you have, you know, a whopping two devices involved, and you're doing some transmit from one to another. And, you know, in the, in the case with almost anything, you have a, an experimental group and a control group. So what we, we started with was using our adaptive interrupt moderation on, on our test server, uh, running an upstream kernel, and we had another system just running an upstream kernel um, with our normal driver. And we slammed traffic at it and watched what happened. And one of the things we found is that we were not getting the throughput that we expected. Um, and it was, we were sort of scratching our head a little bit saying like, well, you know, I would expect that, that we can see that it's moving up to this higher profile. We added some debug FS support so we could see this in real time. And um, it just wasn't happening um, as efficiently as we thought it could. Um, and some of that was because I'd previously tested two systems back to back. So we started doing this control group. Now, well, the performance wasn't worse. It just wasn't as good as I thought it could be. And what I realized is that if you're a sending system, despite not having any transmit interrupt 
moderation features enabled, acts basically are classified as low latency traffic. Acts are small, they're coming all the time, and the, the speed at which you receive an act definitely determines how quickly you're gonna send out traffic again. So we actually did some tuning, and, and so we, we emulated what we thought the algorithms would have done, and on the sender, moved the low latency back to the sender of bulk traffic moved, moved us to a low latency profile, and we actually saw improvements in CPU, CPU utilization. So that was kind of fun, and I think, to me, this is one of the examples, one of the things we can point out that had I spent, had myself or uh, the other folks working on this spent a lot of time thinking about this ahead of time, we probably would have come to this conclusion. Um, maybe, maybe not, you never know. We might give ourselves too much credit. But the difference was that just trying this enabled something newer and maybe more fun than we thought, and it was an improvement. So I think this is a, a for, for me, this is a, a thing I'm gonna continue to think about as a, as a big win for AI showing us something that we didn't think of, we could do before. Um, so the other big takeaway for me is that the kernel has a ton of configuration knobs, a ton. And so many of the folks that have worked on the kernel are, some of them no, no longer working on the kernel. They're doing the next, the next uh, most interesting thing that they think exists. Um, or they're too busy you know, working on the next version of hardware or whatever. That I think there's a lot of low-hanging fruit out there for us to really examine um, different kernel config options. I mean, take, for example, just the discussion I had about the, the Tune D profiles that exist. Well, why do I need to, why do any of those need to exist? What is it, what would, what would it take for us to figure out, with any of these things, what the ideal number of, um, what the ideal settings are for highest performance, or what the ideal settings are for low battery life? Um, even take things like, um, you know, data plane technologies that are of interest to me right now, whether they be BPF and XDP or, or even DPDK. Things like, why do we have to guess at what it takes to be the proper number of packets that we batch anytime, anytime we're doing reception? We can improve packet performance by batching. Well, let's figure out how many that is automatically. Let's not figure out, um, let's not spend four days with a person recompiling and testing over and over again to try to figure it out. So that's, that's my encouragement for all 11 of you that are here um, to, to go forward and figure out and think about whether or not areas you work in can be, can be done automatically. So I uh, also want to uh, leave a little time for questions, but I want to make sure to give a shout out to um, Gil Raka, Archiad, and Tal from Mellanox, who uh, came up with the initial uh, implementation of this, the initial design and push it to their driver, and Rob Rice and Lee Reed and Michael Chan from Broadcom, and then, um, of course, uh, copyright holders saw images used in the presentation. So, that's all I've got. Questions? Please say no. <laughs> That, that would have been, I, I, given more time, I would have loved to have auto-tuned the entire presentation. Um, well, cool, well thank you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, outside the lab? Um, yes, absolutely. So the question was, outside of a lab environment, uh, what sort of other uh, applications have been tested? And um, for me, that's all I have done. Because we had, a lot of this was motivated by a specific requirement from a potential customer. And they had some workloads that they were able to emulate with NetPerf pretty effectively, and so they, they came up with this recipe and said, okay, you can do this, and you can do this, and you can do this, and you can do this, no touch, you know, you have a chance at winning. And so that was a lot of what, um, a lot of what I do in my job now, is to figure out what it takes to do that. And so we looked around and, and looked at different things, and so they came to us with the TCP RR test with NetPerf, and they came to us with some of the TCP stream tests, um, and some other specific things. Um, so aside from just a system-to-system -system test, the other thing that this has been tested on uh, pretty heavily um, from our own interest for another, uh, another reason 
um, was actually syncing the traffic into a VM. So a regular host that was pounding a VM with traffic, um, but both the TCP RR and the TCP stream. So the VM was the sync for the traffic. And um, that's actually one of the interesting points to me is that's where this really shines. Um, whether using uh, Broadcom hardware or Mellanox hardware, because the VM has zero, con the VM might be running Vert IO, and they have zero control over what's happening. So now what you've done is you've got a way where it doesn't matter what workload is being run on those VMs, uh, you, you've given them a chance to, to, to both be successful, because typically both of those separate IP addresses, separate streams, they're going to hash to separate CPUs, so they're going to be on, unless you have really bad luck, uh, and then they're going to, they're going to, be received at different rates, and that's that. I think is the is a, a big strength, and so I look forward to when these upstream kernel changes roll down into the main distros and are used um, in virtual in virtualized environments like that, whether it's OpenStack or just other other places. Um, I think that's going to be key. Yeah. So um, it was it landed in January in Dave Miller's tree. So that probably means for 16. Um, so uh, yeah, so it's freely available in, in everything shipping past that point. Did you have a? Uh, oh yeah, absolutely. So. ESX, I can definitely say, well, okay, I shouldn't say definitely. Um, I haven't been asked to, so Broadcom maintains their own version um, and collaborates on an ESX driver. Uh, I don't think, I haven't been asked by anybody that maintains the, oh, so the question was related to what other virtualization environments, uh, ESX or KVM, um, et cetera. Uh, I can't say for sure. No one has asked me on the ESX driver team anything about this, which is typically a sign that it hasn't been implemented. Um, uh, not always, um, but no, no one's asked. Uh, on the, um, in a KVM environment, if you're running a new enough kernel, this is available. So if you're running, if, you're, if your base kernel on your hypervisor is, I'm just going to go ahead and make a blanket statement and say 417, although I think really 416 or 415 is probably right. Um, like I said, it landed in Dave Miller's tree earlier this year, and his tree is always, it's a development tree, so it's always, you know, one version ahead. So if I do like a git describe, I always have to, add one to whatever's there, because he keeps Linus' tags. Uh, so um, probably should have done that homework. Um, but yeah, any, any, I mean, if you go out and run Fedora with this right now, or even probably, I guess, 18.04 uh, Ubuntu, it's probably got a new enough kernel that it's going to be there. OK. Mm -hmm. It keeps one, it knows the last state, and that's it. Com yeah, very, very low overhead. And that's one of the things that we really liked about it, and why like, it was kind of crazy how simple, the, how simple it was, and how low overhead it was, and how small of an impact it had on, I mean, the impactful part is actually the couple millisecond delay hit that you take, um, less than that, but the, the writing to the hardware if you have to make a change. That we never had to worry about tuning. Um, I mean, you're talking about one or two instructions that with a good compiler are probably going to slide right in with some other delay that you have in the, in the, the network stack. Um, the, the cost is always um, how frequently we wrote to hardware. Like, I can tune that and watch it change. Like, if I write to hardware every 100 packets, um, throughput and latency suffer heavily because you're spending so much time writing out. Um, obviously, if you do it every million packets, it's less useful, um, especially since most flows aren't that long. But, um, but yeah, the, it, it's very lightweight. I mean, I was shocked at how well it worked. Like, it doesn't, and that's, that's the thing, too, is it doesn't have to be complicated. Like, we don't, a lot of the base, this layer is created in such a way that if you wanted to do a very, a much more complicated, stateful inspection and, and keep track of, you know, preemptively decide based on something that's coming in that you should go one way or the other. You could do it, um, but this is such a great, easy intro to start that minimal hit. 
Anything okay. else? Thank you, Andy. Yes, uh, thank we you. have a coffee break from now till 11.20 and we will be resuming session then. Cool. Thank you.